Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Deanne Barrett. This is Lit From Within, connecting teens to their inner resources. Today we have Dr. Larry Rosen with us. He's Professor Emeritus and past Chair of Psychology at California State University, Dominguez Hills. He's a research psychologist, computer educator, keynote speaker, and is recognized as an international expert in the psychology of technology. Welcome, Dr. Rosen. Thank you very much for having me. So your work really taps into the way we're interacting with technology, and I know from reading your blog that we can't always believe everything we hear through the media about things like Facebook and social networking and the effects they have on us. And as a high school teacher, I really appreciate being able to speak to the source in terms of where that information comes from and get some credible information. Um, tell us a little bit about the scope of your work. Um, in our lab, we have been studying the psychology of technology since 1985. So this is well before smartphones, well before the internet, well, right about the start of the internet. And we have watched people's reactions to technology start with computer phobia, then go through mm -hmm. technophobia, and then go to, oh my God, I love this stuff. And now we've gone, I think, almost back circled, and instead of being computer phobic, what we are is obsessed. Mm. And that is probably more dangerous than being phobic. Hmm. Why is that? Why is that more dangerous? Well, because it drives our behavior in an interesting way. Um, for example, we just did a study with college students where we asked them to put an app on their phone that monitored on a daily basis how many times they unlocked their phone and how many minutes it stayed unlocked. The typical college student, and, the, and our students are a little older, our average age is around 25, so these are not 19, 20-year-old college students, these are 25-year-olds, um, open their phone 60 times a day, which is about every 15 minutes of wake time, for about four minutes a time, which means that they're on their phone for about four hours a day. Mm. And the interesting thing is it's at four-minute bites, so they get on, they check a few things, they get off. They wait for 10, 15 minutes, they get on, they check a few things, they get off. And it's constant all day long, and as some of our sleep research shows, all night long too. Hmm. And so tell us a little bit about what that pattern does. I know we're speaking with an audience of teens and their parents. Um, we want to know a little bit about what that pattern looks like when teens are trying to get things done, like studying, for example. What do the researchers know about how teens are studying? So it's, it's interesting because people have speculated about how teens have studied, and we really wanted to know. And so what we did is we sent about 150 researchers out to find someone that they knew who was a middle school student, a high school student, and a college student, and to simply watch them study for 15 minutes and every minute record, are they studying? What's on their computer screen? Is their phone nearby? What are they doing? Basically everything, mm -hmm. as well as looking at how much they use technology during the day, if they have study habits, study strategies, um, what websites they looked at while they were studying, things like that. A couple things we found, which was, I think, a little scary, but also fascinating that students were able to study for about three to five minutes before they got distracted. And then they got distracted for a couple of minutes, and then they studied for three to five minutes again. And then they got distracted and three to five minutes, even though we told them study something very important and we are watching you. We were sitting right behind them watching them, which we would have assumed would have meant they would have studied for the whole 15 minutes. Instead, they studied for about nine of the 15 minutes. Six minutes, they did something else. What do they typically do? Their time was spent either texting or using social media, particularly Facebook. Wow. And when we asked if, when we looked at those 15 minutes and we asked what would best predict your grades, by the way, it didn't matter whether you were a middle school student, a high school student, or a college student, everybody studied the same for some reason. When we asked what predicts your GPA, we found out that number one was if you spent more time studying, you got a better GPA, that's not surprising. Number two was if you had study strategies, you had a better GPA. Number three was if you used more media during the day, you had a worse GPA. And then the interesting one was if you checked Facebook at least once or more during the 15 minutes, you had a worse GPA. Mm. Now, why Facebook? 
Because what Facebook does is it represents communication, which distracts you from what you're doing, you're studying, which means that when you finish your distraction and you go back to studying, your three extra three to five minutes studying, maybe a minute of that is, is relearning what you had to learn before. It's finding the place in your chemistry chapter where you remembered something. It's going back five pages to the beginning of a chapter to start reading again. So it's not just you study for three minutes, then you study again for three minutes and you're in the same place. It just doesn't work that way. Mm. And so do you believe that, that those short bursts of studying and then going to something else is because of this technology or have we always had a pattern of that in our minds of studying, going to something else in the mind perhaps? Or is this, uh, do you believe it's a new phenomenon because of the technology we're surrounded with? This is an absolutely new phenomenon. Now granted, students have never been able to study straight for 15 minutes, but what they would do is get up and walk around, they would make a sandwich, they would have a cup of coffee, they would do whatever, whatever they did. We measured those kind of things. Those weren't important anymore. Mm -hmm. What was important was your phone. And so this is new. And interestingly enough, if you couple it with other research, what it shows is you probably could do just as well on tests if you're studying for a test, say. But two things. One, it will take you longer. And two, it will add more stress. And stress is not good. And that's what I'm most concerned about is we have these students who are constantly just self-distracting, self-distracting, or being distracted by beeps, mm -hmm. buzzes, vibrations, whatever coming back to studying, thinking that they're doing fine, getting stressed out, getting distracted, getting stressed out, getting distracted, getting stressed out. And it's just this continuous loop. So by the time they think they've studied enough, it's really late, they're very tired, they're not really learning as much, and they won't do as well in, in school on the tests that they were studying for, on the report they were writing, whatever they were supposed to be doing. And so is there a solution in sight? Well, I think the solution is actually very simple, but it's going to take some time. I'm, I'm uh, pretty much of a behaviorist, and I believe that if you can change someone's behavior, then you can change the thoughts and the beliefs and the emotions behind the behavior. So what I always suggest to people is something I call technology breaks. And I'll use it in the case of a student studying because that's the easiest way to do it. So the students mm -hmm. studying, they have their laptop in front of them. They have their phone right next to them maybe their iPad to the left, maybe their phone to the right, whatever. Usually the right because they're right-handed and they want to make sure they grab it as soon as it buzzes. So here's what a tech break is. You tell them to check on their computer every um, communication website. So that would mostly be Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever, and then close them down. Check anything they want on their phone and close it down. Total time you can do that is one minute. Turn your phone on silent, set the alarm for 15 minutes, and then you don't get to look at your phone, you don't get to open any of those websites, you just study. So if it's on a book, you study, if it's on your computer, you study. When the alarm goes off, you get one minute to check everything on your computer, on your phone, whatever, you set the alarm for 15, you just keep repeating and repeating and repeating. Once you're used to that behavior, and you'll know you're used to it, by the way, if you're a student, when the alarm goes off, and you say, hey, just a minute, just a minute, I'll get to it in a second, I'm studying, I'm right in the middle, I know I gotta get this stuff. Then you'll know 15 is great, now make it 20, and then 25. And I think if students can get it up to 30 minutes where they can go 30 whole minutes without checking in, that's great. The problem is, is that when you start this, you have to alert all your friends because they're going to text you and go, wait a minute, why didn't you text me back immediately? You must be mad at me, blah, blah, blah. So you need to tell all your friends, I'm checking my text messages every 15 minutes or 20 or 30 or whatever. I'm checking my email every 30 minutes. I'm going to check social media every 30 minutes. I will get back to you soon, don't worry. Doesn't mean anything. If you do that, by the time you get up to about 30 minutes, that's a good chunk of time to be able to study straight through. I think any student can study for 30 minutes, they're gonna do great. I love it, I love your approach because it's not um, prescribing don't do it, and it's setting some limits on doing it, and you also recognize that people need to tell their friends they're doing this because they're feeling like they're gonna lose out on those social connections. Right, and social connections, by the way, are the reason that phone, that smartphone, is so popular because it mm -hmm. contains all your social connections. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you say to parents who are fearful about the amount of time that their students are spending on social media? How can we give them some hope? Well, when I talk to parents, I say a couple things. One, 
I say, you cannot let your kid until you're comfortable with your kid's behavior be on social media without at least being in a public area. And so what I recommend is that you make a deal with your kid that they're allowed to be on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, but they have to bring their laptop or their phone or whatever they're working on out to the kitchen table or somewhere where you can watch. Somewhere where you can, the parent can watch their facial expressions to see if all of a sudden there's tears in their eyes or all of a sudden there's some sort of anger or whatever. Because when you're on social media, you're behind a glass screen. And typically, when you're behind a glass screen, the reflection that you see in the screen is you, not the person on the other end. And so people say things that are hurtful, they say things that are angry, they say things that are mean, cruel, and they don't really mean it, but it's simple to do because you're behind a screen and where's the ramifications for saying something like that? Mm -hmm. So I always recommend to parents that you first have your kids do it in a public area and that you spend time talking to them about it. And that's really important. I think that at least once a week, parents need to have a conversation with their kids about what they're doing on social media, what they're doing with technology. If they're having any problems, be real open. Um, I recommend that everybody sit on the floor so you're at a roughly equal height level so that the kids feel comfortable talking, that the parents zip their lips a lot and listen really carefully to what their kids are saying about what they're experiencing. Because there is a lot of stuff going on on social media that's great. There's a lot of stuff going on, on social media that's fairly troubling. Same thing with video gaming, same thing with pretty much anything that's done online, parents need to be vigilant, at least in watching what's going on. Um, I recommend that if your kids are playing, do a technology in their bedroom, that it's an open door policy and that the parents at least walk in once a time, walk behind them, look at what the kids are doing. I believe that the parents need to set little time limits with the kids that they negotiate. Maybe you can be on for 45 minutes straight and then you take a 15 minute break. Um, and do something else. Parents and the kids can negotiate the time. Um, I believe that parents should reinforce their kids when they do well. An extra 15 minutes of video gaming this weekend, an extra hour of video gaming, an extra 10 minutes on Facebook, whatever. Some good reinforcer that will encourage the kids to keep good behavior. Um, I think if it gets bad, if it gets really tough, that you have to start setting rules and you have to write those rules out on a piece of paper and you know, if you do this, here's the penalty. If you do this, here's the good thing that happens. If you do this, here's the penalty. If you do this, here's the good thing that happens. And pay, put a copy of it on the refrigerator because that's where most teenagers go and put a copy of it on their mirror in their bathroom because that's where most teenagers look. And, and be vigilant. And don't be those kind of parents who say, five more minutes and then you've got to come to dinner. Uh, okay, you can have another three. Okay, you can have another two. Okay, yeah, just wait until you're done with that round, with that level. No, five minutes means five minutes. And so you have to be vigilant as a parent. And it's too easy to not, quite honestly. Yeah, I love that you addressed that. Not when the level is over, but in the time frame I set for you. Yeah, that's an easy trap to get in. Well, it's the time frame that you set together. That's right. the thing. And, and I think that's the key that most parents don't get. You negotiate with your kid. You negotiate the rules. You get them so that the rules are clear between you and the kid. You've agreed on it. It's not you've put rules from the outside. You two have talked about it. Here's the rules. You can play video games for an hour. The kid will say, I want to play longer. Okay, how much longer would you like to play? Okay, then you have to earn the extra time. Mm, and, and, they, and they can earn extra time for doing things like setting the table, 15 extra minutes, taking out the trash, 15 extra minutes, doing your chores on time, 15 extra minutes, whatever. I love it. That's a low, low cash output for those chores. It's just time trading. I love yep. it. Up next in our next segment, we're going to talk more about technology and sleep. So join us for the next clip. <laughs> 